Good afternoon, guys. How you doing? Yeah, about the same as me. Um, my name is Scott Hammersley. I'm with I, IP Architects. Um, I'm going to be presenting on uh, CHR HA for PPPoE. Um, I'm going to try and try. Sorry. Now you can hear me. Um, so again, I'm with IP Architects. I'm going to try and keep this brief because I know we all want to get out of here and you know we've got a lottery to go to. And but um, working in the industry for 20 years, all the standard stuff, um, Magtech certified, all that good stuff. I'm going to try and skip through the minutia. Uh, IP Architects we're a global consulting company. Um, we do managed networks, monitoring, load testing, development, that and above. Quite a lot of other things too. Um, I'm sure you've seen all the orange shirts walking around. I've got two sitting right there. Um, obviously, you mostly speak to Derek. He'll keep you on your toes. Um, offices around the world, um, different time zones, different engineers. Um, okay, so the goal of this presentation, um, hopefully you'll come away for, with, it, with some ideas of how to create a highly available environment for PPPoE aggre aggregation, if that's what you guys do. Um, it's quite simple. It's not a hard task to do. And obviously, we're going to talk about why the CHR fits this in a, in a virtual role. Um, and you'll probably notice the next couple of slides I stole from Kevin. Um, I need to put some slide count up there, but he actually put this already together of why you would go CHR versus physical. Um, there's numerous benefits, um, but mainly the, the biggest one is the CHR just seems to handle um, application forwarding better than, than the physical side of it. Um, the TLU processor is obviously brilliant at network, pro uh, network processing, but as soon as you start adding up those services, you'll tend to see the CPU start to spike and the resources degrade and all that stuff. Right there. Obviously, again, it's one of the Kevin's presentation slides. I'm sure if you watched this presentation yesterday morning, you've already seen this. But basically, this just lays out the CHR, some of the, um, the points that we try to get across versus Telera and ARM. Obviously, either in the CCR and the, the 411 or 2011. Okay, and as I was saying, we've, we've done pretty extensive testing on the CHRs and on the CCRs when it comes to uh, aggregating, whether it be PPPoE, whether it be IPsec tunnels, um, all sorts of other stuff. And we've generally found that the CHR is the, is the preferred method to go. And obviously, it gives you more flexibility as well if you've got a virtual environment. You can spin up a HA environment pretty quickly. Um, um, and obviously, there's different options available for x86 hardware to run the CHR on, um, whether you want to build a lab or you want to do it in production. Um, we like the Maxway Vengeance, always have done, since we've got it out, and obviously, you'll see Brian walking around. Okay, so what is PPPoE for those of you that don't know? It formed a long, long time ago in the, in the old service provider days. Um, originally, it was just PPP. Then it was PPPoA, then it's PPPoE, basically just denominating whether it was over ATM or over Ethernet. Um, it was the preferred method of, of connection for the service providers at that time, and still is to this day. A lot of the big service providers will still use PPPoE to terminate their client subscribers for a vast amount of different options and reasons, which we'll, we'll go into here in just a minute. Um, one of the main reasons was back in the ATM days, where it was all layer two, it didn't matter about splitting up the, the domains. It all just came back to a single aggregation point or multiple aggregation points, depending on how it was configured. And that's how they ran the networks, whether it be DSL. Um, cable's a bit different, obviously MTS, but they didn't do that. Again, it's one of the most widely used protocols in the industry uh, for terminating subscribers and managing them. It's a layer two protocol. Um, the connection is initiated from the client onto either a BRAS or an access concentrator. They're both almost the same type of thing, but 
there's some subtle differences to them. And then when you use it with Radius, um, you get a complete package of authentication, authorization, um, different options for limiting custom speeds, you, know, you name it. With the Radius attributes, you can pretty much pass down whatever you want to to a client, and especially in MarkTech, with the MarkTech-specific options, you're able to do like, your access lists and queues and many other different things. Um, so yeah, layer two is one big domain. Um, some of the drawbacks to PPPoE, uh, you do incur overhead. So your NTU must be set correctly or accordingly. And if you don't, you can you get away with it by using TCP MSS adjust, which will adjust the NTU as needed. So that you're not, can anybody hear me? Am I moving this mic away too much? I don't know. Okay, so in PPPoE, there are several different uh, packets that are used. Obviously, pad I, O, R, S, and T. Basically, just depicting the different stages at which the client initiates a connection to the server and how the server responds. This comes into play later on when we try to figure out how to do a HA load balancing solution. And basically, the packet that we're really interested in is the pad O. The client will initiate with a pad I. The server will receive it with a pad O and send back a request and session confirmation. And then when the client, either when the client is ready to terminate or the server, it will send a pad T. So just the subtle differences between the BRAS and AC. There isn't really much difference. Back in the day when it was dial-up, it was a BRAS. These days it's just called an access concentrator. They're pretty much doing the same thing. So the problem that we're trying to solve, um, this can be described in many different ways, but what we're trying to do is to create a highly available system so that if one uh, device tends, tends to fail, we've got to back up and re-evaluate re and reset and reconnect. What we're really looking to do is try to have an active-active. And I didn't put that in the slide, but um, in either cases, if we're doing a virtualized CHR, it's pretty easy to spin up a CHR and add that in. And as the resources grow and you put more tax on the boxes, you just go ahead and build up another CHR and you distribute that load that way. Um, okay, so this is just setting the stage for, for the lab. We basically just want to add a second access concentrator and we want to try and balance the the connections out as best as possible. Now, what I'm not going to get into is how you get the PPPoE back to your termination aggregation. Um, I'm just assuming it's all one layer two at the moment, either to a tower or you're at the core and it's coming back to there. I don't, you know, I'm not going to go into MPLS and VPLS or EOIP. Um, that's just something that can be evaluated later on. So basically, we're going to have two Magtic CHRs configured as ACs just doing local authentication for this test and IP assignments. Uh, one CHR just to a switch, and then four clients that will ramp up 200 connections on each to try and simulate the, uh, the low bouncing feature. So as you see on the diagram, um, pretty much what I just said, the two BRAS at the top, four clients at the bottom. We're just assuming one layer two domain at the moment. So when there's only one AC in play, the client has no choice who to connect to, obviously. However, when we introduce a second AC and assume you have not configured service names or other identifying parameters, the client will choose the AC with the lowest MAC address in the offer packet. This means the connection will most likely always be to the same access concentrator, even though both are responding with a pad O and the client receives them. is a problem with the slide. So anyway, this is what we did for the test. Basically just set four VLANs, put different PADO delays on each side, and I wrote a script just to initiate those connections from the clients so we can test it. You'll see that the four VLANs, VLAN 10 for example, is 100 milliseconds on one side, and it's 1,000 milliseconds on the second, and then vice versa for each VLAN.
So you know, as you saw, we defined the PADO offset for each VLAN. And this is just the snippet of the configuration that we saw there. And you'll see the, the PADO dash delay equals 100. Like I said, it's a pretty simple configuration. And by offsetting the PADO on each access concentrator, we can manipulate the access concentrators to send the offer in a staggered time frame. What we're effectively doing is delaying the packet so that neither access concentrator will respond at the same time. Now, it's not always foolproof, but 99% of the time, that's what happens. And this allows the client to respond back to the first access concentrator that sends the PADO. So, as I was saying, there's many different considerations in the lab and to, to the real world. We're not taking into account any IP addressing or authentication methods. Uh, one of the problems or one of the issues and things you'd have to tackle would be IP, IP address assignments, uh, depending if you're doing uh, public IP addresses or you're doing private, whether you're natting out of each or you're having a, a NAT box itself that sits upstream. Um, and then, obviously, radius and billing authentication would also make the issue of its own IP addressing pool go away. And you'd also probably want to be doing some sort of IGP so that you're announcing those IP addresses to the upstream core so that you're not manually having to do static routes or even single slash 32 host routes. And it's not a new method. It's not the... I mean, it's not young method either, it's been around a long time. Um, but it's definitely one of the more configurable ways of, of terminating clients and having a radius system or a billing system tie into that. Um, but going back to the CHR, again, if you're adding high availability on a virtualized system, it can becomes a lot easier to add a CHR in than try to put a physical box in. And you can spin up as needed on resources. All right, went through that pretty quick. Questions? Oh, great. So you see I'm, I'm struggling up here. Cool. Um, and I'm on time. It's 4 o'clock. So thanks, guys.